Welcome back to Acts. We are still in chapter 13 and the story of the um, visit of Paul and Barnabas now to the city of Antioch in Pisidia. Program note, we've corrected it in class. Those of you watching it online in the previous class to this one, when John Mark leaves the, the party in the city of Perga and goes back to Jerusalem, at one point I seem to have mentioned that it was Barnabas who left, but um, I'm sure those of you watching it online have caught the mistake as well, so you don't need to write me on that. Our sharp students here in the classroom have already pointed that out. It was John Mark who leaves, not Barnabas. So John, Barnabas and Paul now have gone on to the city of Antioch. They've gone along this particular road, the uh, Via Sebaste, uh, which goes up from Perga up to Antioch in Pisidia. And so a little bit about this Antioch in Pisidia. It is a significant city in this region of, of, of Phrygia, uh, right on the edge of what was considered Galatia. When you study Galatians and you learn that the Southern Galatian theory of the letter and, and all of that, but understanding the extent of Galatia, there are, uh, there are inscriptions that show that in that period, all the way over here was considered to be part of Galatia. But even though it's right on the, the edge of Pisidia and Phrygia right here. But Antioch was a, a, a significant city. It was founded by, uh, once again, that great family that we studied in the book of Daniel, the Seleucids. And they put their name on it, uh, the Antiochene family um, uh, that, that, that came along uh, on these cities. So that's where we get the name Antioch. But that was in the Greek period. Now it's in the Roman period. What has happened to the city in the time of the, the Romans is it has been built up by uh, Romans, particularly Augustus, uh, the big guy, uh, or the big dog, we could call him, the founder of the Roman Empire. And we might as well put his name up here on the board because uh, we're going to be talking about Augustus a bit uh, here as we come to Antioch in Pisidia. This is Augustus Caesar, the founder of the Roman Empire, formerly named Octavian, adopted son of Julius Caesar, who by this time is dead. Uh, the, the emperor at the time of our story here is the emperor Claudius. But we're, we're talking about what Augustus did. He has built up many cities, but Antioch is one of them and put a lot of money into it, a lot of it from his own, let's say his own pocketbook, but his pocketbook is not, not, not a whole lot of difference between that and the state pocketbook because it's the spoils of war and all that is poured into Rome. But he does uh, build up the infrastructure of the city, and he, 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 they, they build a, a two-level aqueduct. There's, there, there are the remains in Antioch of a two-level two aqueduct from the hills, um, I think to the um, to the south of the of the city that brought water in. They had plenty of water supply from the hills around there. And Augustus also settles into this area a lot of his retired soldiers from the legions. And um, I think I mentioned at the time we were talking about the centurion earlier in, in the book of Acts that if you had 20, 25 years of service in as a centurion or a, a soldier, you would be retired, and if uh, you were still alive, you could be given a parcel of land. Spain was a big place for that, and now once they took over Asia Minor, this area became places where they parceled out land to retired legionaries. Upwards of two or 3,000 former legionaries had been settled in Antioch in Pisidia. And so there was a large Roman, um, retired Roman uh, feature there, as well as other peoples, there was a large Jewish uh, presence as well. well. We do know from the story of the Greek period that they actually brought in from way over here in Babylon, um, a, lot of, a lot of Jews were imported by the, the, in, the Seleucid families into Antioch and Pisidia, resettled there. And so this, this creates a, a synagogue presence for Paul to come in as we come, in, come into the story here where he will preach. And so this is a, a little bit of, of, of the background. Now, because Augustus has put a lot of money there 
and he's also settled some of his former soldiers in Antioch and Pisidia, there was a large temple to Augustus, or as they would have referred to him by this time, to the divine Augustus. All right? Because he's now deified, been deified by the Senate. He's a god. He has his own temple, and he's worshipped. This is the remains of, that t- of the temple in Antioch and Pisidia. I took this picture uh, when we were there. Uh, actually, the day we were there, we had the whole ruins of Antioch and Pisidia to our, ourselves, about 15 of us. And it was a, a good day for that. Didn't have crowds of tourists. And it was kind of off, a, off the beaten track at that time of year. And so we were able to just kind of go wherever we wanted to. And uh, this is the remains. This is the, what remains of a large monumental temple to Augustus from that period of time. And that is important to understand. Here's a, here's a back view of it. And it, you, you, it's on the highest part of the city, and it is situated to look out over the city. And around, you see that it's kind of set in a little basin here, the remains of a basin. This was a huge temple complex. There was a, a two-story complex of buildings behind this temple. The temple itself was quite large. Inside that temple was a large monumental statue of Augustus, probably in a seated form. They found um, a similar one down in Herculaneum, which is near uh, ancient Pompeii, and is in a museum down there of him setting in, a, uh, in, a, in, in that setting. And so this, this is a significant feature of the city that is going to play into the sermon that we're going to read about here that Paul gives in the synagogue. Now, this, is look, this would be looking down from that temple to a lower part of the city. This is a, the ruins of a Byzantine basilica. Basilica is a, a Byzantine term for church, Christian church, from the later oh, 5th or 6th century or beyond. These are the ruins of it. They make the claim that this is built on the remains, the foundation of a synagogue. Archaeologists dispute that. But when you, if you ever go to Antioch and Pisidia, and I hope that someday in the near future, maybe in the next couple, three years, we can organize a tour of the first journey of Paul through these regions, and you could see this, anybody that would want to go. But they tell you that this was built on the ruins of, of the synagogue into which Paul goes and preaches. Archaeologists dispute that, but, it's, but they have not found the ruins of a synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia doesn't mean that it's not there. They just haven't excavated all of the, all of the city. So they have not found it, but they know that this, this church is here. It's called St. John's Basilica. And you go there, you can kind of crawl around on, on the, uh, the remains of it. Uh, but at least it gives you a visual to, to look at and to consider in, um, uh, in, in this particular setting because this temple looks down upon the city. Now, um, with that as a, a background... Let's once again just keep in mind how this man, Augustus, was looked at. I covered this at the beginning of our study in Acts, but just a quick review. This, Augustus was the emperor when Christ was born. He was still alive. And he was already worshipped as semi-divine while he lived. But afterwards, certainly elevated to the status. But what was happening in the period leading up to the period of the birth of Jesus, was this adulation that was growing, being heaped upon Augustus by the Roman culture. He had saved Rome. Civil war erupted after Julius Caesar's assassination. Octavian had to uh, defeat Mark Antony, and then you know later he was Mark Antony was aligned with Cleopatra, and we covered a little bit of that story. Octavian prevails. He becomes the emperor. Mark Anthony commits suicide. He's the sole ruler of Rome. In in time, he's given this religious name, Augustus, and the Caesar from from Julius, and he changes his name. And so he is known from that point on, uh, no longer Octavian, he is Augustus. But he is looked upon as the savior of Rome. And this is important, all right? 
that, uh, that word is soter in the Greek, but he is looked upon as the savior. Poems are written about him. There's a um, poet Ovid, O-V-I-D, and Virgil, who, you know, look, in every epic of great men and legendary figures, somebody writes a poem about them, somebody writes an epic novel or story about the hero, and they, they're elevated to, uh, you know, larger status, and they, they become these figures. Virgil, who wrote the Aeneid, and other works, and Ovid and others, in their writings, they refer to this age as the age of Augustus, as the age of a savior that has come. This is the idea that the Romans are thinking about. And this is in the period leading up to the birth of Jesus, who is the true savior. But a counterfeit is being per perpetrated upon the Roman world into which Jesus is going to be born. And this is an important part of the story to understand why, uh, you know, why Jesus at that time and what was going on in the larger world. Satan had his purpose, and he's working through this beast power, the fourth beast of, of Daniel 7, Rome, and all that it, that, that it means, and what is, what, is taking, what is taking place here. Now, Augustus bought into the hype. You know, it's good to be king, the song says. It's good to be king. And toward the end of his life, Augustus writes up something that is called the Res Gestae Divi Augusti. This is a, the Latin. He writes his own epitaph. It's it translated, it means the things accomplished by the divine Augustus. The things accomplished by the divine Augustus. And he actually wrote it with his own hand. And he ordered that bronze castings of it be made and placed on the temples and prominent places throughout the empire. So everybody would know what he did. And there are, there are fragments of it. In, in fact, in this temple in Antioch and Pisidia, they found fragments of it. And this is all that's left. Uh, they, they were able to put it together somewhat like a jigsaw puzzle and fill in a little bit some, and pieces of it. But this is what was on a part of that entire temple complex in Antioch and Pisidia, when people would come up to do worship, which they had to do every year at least, and uh, to, to Augustus, actually on the 23rd of every month, which was the day of his birth, there would, been, would have been a ceremony uh, in, the, in these temples dotted around uh, to, to Augustus. But they would have stopped and they would have read. This is taken from the, a replica that is on um, the um, altar of peace right next to his mausoleum in Rome itself. If you ever go there, you can see this. But it, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, he's, he says a lot of things. Um, what, what he says, let me give you a few quotes, because this is all going to dovetail into the sermon Paul gives. One of the most important inscriptions from that period on this res gestae is, quote, the thing, which means the things accomplished by Augustus, the inscription speaks of his deliverance of the Roman world from civil war. That's one prominent thing. He saves the Roman world in the aftermath of the assassination of Caesar, and he mentions that. This is how he is looked upon. Um, he also mentions his lavish benefactions upon the Roman people, the number of public buildings erected at his own expense, his diligence in rewarding veterans, and I mentioned that here in Antioch, about 3,000 veterans of the Roman army were settled here, given land. And the many different public honors, you know, the, the divine Augustus, you know, hail, hail Caesar and all of this, that were given to him on account of his virtue. What was his virtue? Well, he killed a lot of people. And if you crossed him, you could use your life, lose your life too. So virtues in the Roman world were a little different than the virtues that Jesus came uh, teaching. But he talks about that. Um, and so he, he puts all of this on this realm. Now, if, at some point, maybe while we're in, in Acts, I will show you a little clip of a film. It's a reenactment of, of Augustus in his palace, in the ruins of his palace in Rome. And he is talking to a woman dressed in white who is a symbol of Europa. 
Europe. And he's talking to her in a, a staged setting. It was done as a promotional film. I, I got a copy of it in a museum when we were there back in 2015. And it's good enough to show, and I'll show that to you, but he, he's, the, the dialogue in this little film is from the Res Gestae. And he's talking about himself and what he did. And, uh, but he's also, in that particular film, he's talking to this woman who represents Europe, pushing her or pushing Europe. It's really a propaganda film put out by somebody a few years ago to basically tell Europe to get its act together and become what Augustus was and to lead, uh, which dovetails into what we will study in Revelation 17 and 18. Uh, so maybe at that time I'll show it to you as well. Um, but this is, a, this is all the, 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 back, the background to that. And so he's, Augustus is looked upon as a savior, um, and you know, his words and his whole approach are, are to mimic and imitate the gospel in a counterfeit manner and to deceive the world. It, it is a physical counterfeit of Satan's spiritual plan to overthrow and to defy the, the actual word, word of God. And so with that in mind, and with this setting, then let's, um, let's look at what, what happens as Paul comes into um, the, the, uh, the city. Let me get to my notes here to get us to the point. Uh, verse 14 of chapter 13, Acts 13, verse 14 then. They depart from Perga. They come, they came to Antioch and Pisidia. Luke just moves right through it. He doesn't tell you how, what they had for lunch along the way or how many days it took. He just, they came. And then they went in, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sat down. All right, now, was it on the side of, of uh, this building? We don't know. But it could be. But at least that gives you a visual. Look at the snow-capped mountains in the background and uh, uh, quite an interesting setting. But it was just down the hill from this temple to Augustus that Paul then comes in, sets down in the synagogue, verse 15, and after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, Paul and Barnabas, saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. The opportunity presents itself. Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, reaches out, and he said, and here's then as a synopsis of what was probably longer, but as, as Luke gives it to us here, men of Israel, the Jews that were there, Jewish synagogue, and you who fear God. Now here's that phrase here that tells us that there are more than just Jews in the audience there are those who fear God or, what's the term? God fears. A class of people, largely Gentile, who have associated themselves with the synagogue. They believe in the values of Judaism, of the, the law of Moses and, and, and what Judaism is at that time. The, the ethics, the virtues, the teachings of the Mosaic law are more appealing to these Gentiles then the virtues of Augustus and the pagan world that he symbolizes. And so they, they said, instead of going up here, they're going to the synagogue. And here's where they hear this message from Paul. You who fear God, listen. Verse 17. What Paul done, does is very similar to Stephen's message in that he kind of recounts a, a brief truncated history of God's actions upon Israel, and an emphasis on, on uh, the, God's actions, all right? God is not a passive God. He moves, He thunders, He delivers, He acts. He gets things done at particular points in time. And this is kind of how He shapes His, his narrative here. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and exalted the people, the Israelites, their descendants, when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. So he moves quickly in one phrase to um, their, their time 
as strangers in Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it, the Exodus. And that whole period of time he brings them out. So it's God's actions. God chose Abraham, told Abraham to act as well. Get you out of your country to a place I will show you. So Abraham had to act too. As disciples, we have to act on God's word. We have to act on God's promises. That's called faith. And so keep that in mind. God promises. God says He will do. He will bless. He will deliver. He will heal. He will hear. He will act. We have to take action too. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they had to act. He brought them out of it. Verse 18, now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Interesting phrase, the way he puts it. He put up with their ways. You know, was, that's the eternal lament of a parent. I put up with you. <laughs> we put up with you children and, you know, we raised you. We, you know, we had, we, you know, as parents, every generation of parents, we put up with our children. We love our children. We, but we also have to take the, the uh, sometimes the good, you know, the, always take the good, but we always have to take whatever bad happens, and that's part of parenting. That's part of the family relationship. We put up with each other, but God put up with their ways in the wilderness. He didn't, you know, He, he chastised them, He corrected them, but He never forsook them. He didn't neglect them. Even when He was about ready to, remember Moses stood in. God, don't do this. Take me instead. God never forsook the children of Israel when they deserved to be forsaken, but He never did. When He had destroyed seven nations, verse 19, the land of Canaan, He distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, He gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And He, he deals in whole numbers here. This is kind of rounded off, so don't worry about the exact this and that it, it, uh, that's understood. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, so God had to act upon Saul because of his disobedience, what did he do? He raised up to them David as king. So again, you, you see the, the force of action throughout this uh, story that, that Paul uh, brings together here. And it's a David as king that... There, there's a, a, a nexus, a, a focal point, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And so he's quickly brought to this point, and it's, it's, it's almost like he uses David now as a bridge to the power of the son of David in the next verse when he refers to David's seed, for this, from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And so it's from this man's seed would be David. Christ was of the lineage of David. But the promise, according to the promise, would be understood in a probably a twofold way. The Genesis 12 promise to Abraham uh, of, of the seed, the, the spiritual aspect of that part of the promise, of Jesus, but also it, we, you could understand the, the promise here, verse 23, to the promise to David of his seed, and uh, what, would, what would be there. And, and really, at this particular point, there's a very powerful allusion to Isaiah 11, the whole chapter, Isaiah chapter 11, um, which is a very powerful messianic uh, passage. If you want to turn there briefly, we'll just note a few verses. Daniel or Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. The stem of Jesse is David. All right, David was the son of Jesse. There shall come forth a rod, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's referring to Christ. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit 
of, uh, and the fear of the fear of the Lord. The whole passage in chapter 11 of Isaiah is a messianic passage. And Paul here is connecting to it in his, in his sermon back in Antioch in, Pis in um, Pisidia at verse 23 when he, he says, God raised up for Israel a Savior. Now the other part of this, uh, which is, should be understood here in verse 23, the Savior is Jesus. Okay? I'll put this over here, Jesus. It's not Augustus. It's not that guy. But keep in mind, Paul's giving this sermon in Antioch almost literally in the shadow of this great monumental temple to Augustus in a city with a lot of people loyal and faithful to Augustus. And among these God-fearers would be Gentiles, maybe even former legionaries. We don't know, but imagine that, who had served under Augustus or the, the legions of Rome given a part of land as a result of the settlement there, their, their families had, maybe their father or grandfather. And yet they're God-fearers here, they're hearing a message. Jews are hearing this message, who have to have a very uneasy um, relationship in the city of Antioch and Pisidia and the cult of Augustus that is there in that temple. And here Paul comes and he says, God raised up according to the promise for, say, for Israel, a soter, a savior. That's where the politics get into it. Paul is making a statement against the cult of Augustus. That's political, folks. That's from a basis of truth. Not part, Paul's not a partisan politician. But he is now getting personal. This is a really bold sermon. And when you understand it in the context of what he was doing, he could have had a soldier of Rome or official of the city heard him. They could have hauled him out for tyranny, for insurre inciting insurrection, hate speech, read. You ever heard of that today? Well, they could have done that. The parallels of what's going on today in our society at the highest levels of culture, in education, in government, mirror and parallel the setting of, of Rome and the culture there. Paul could have, Paul was making a statement that, you know, some of the Jews could have said, Paul, you're getting too political. We just want to hear the gospel. We just want to hear about God, in their case. But had it been a, let's say, a church, we just want to hear about Jesus. We just want to hear a good Christian living message. Paul, we just need something to get us to Monday morning and Tuesday morning, Thursday afternoon, and through the week, a, a, a message that's helpful, good, soft. We don't need politics. We don't need you kind of stirring things up. We don't need you talking about, because the word Savior would have been a word, that, that's a word that would have triggered, triggered thoughts. You ever hear that phrase today? Trigger words? Oh, I don't feel safe now. I don't feel safe. We need to report you to HR. You need to go through some remedial training. Because you don't feel, I don't feel safe. This is our culture today. And sometimes even in our own midst, we don't want to deal with some of the hard statements that need to be understood about our world today, what's happening culturally, educationally, government, and power as it's being exercised in all the different forms to control and to shape a narrative and a story and to control a people and frankly to bring down a, to bring down a people. Well, Paul knew that Augustus was not God, that Zeus was not God. Nothing was, you know, a, a part of that was God. And that Christ had come of the seed of David and that he was the true Savior whose virtues were perfect. Remember we read from the Res Gestae? 
We're on that res gestae, Augustus talked about how his, vir his virtues were lauded. And I, I built these buildings, these roads, these institutions. I did this. I was celebrated. And I was the one who's connected to the, the savior of Rome. And Paul is coming along and saying, no, he's not. He's not a savior to be giving sacrifices to. His virtues are the virtues of a different world order. And that the true savior is Jesus. This, this statement in verse 23 is very powerful in the context of the day on which he gave it and what it means. Let's go on to verse 24. After John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was, was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to, to lose. Quoting John's pointing to Jesus. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God. So he, he draws in all of the people sitting in front of him, not only the Jews, but those who fear God, as well as the sons of Abraham, the Jews. To you, the word of this salvation has been sent. There's that word salvation again. He's getting political. Maybe some people are squirming out there in the Jewish, in the pews. Oh boy, I better get out of here before the authorities come in. I don't want to be caught anywhere near this. It's going to impact my, my shop and my, my work my contracts, my standing in the community. And because he's saying to you, the word of this salvation, it's the word of God. It's the truth. It's not the words on that res gestae just up the hill written by Augustus. Augustus's res gestae was his last will and testament, but it was also his epistle. It was his gospel. It was a, it was a Roman gospel of a dead man now worshipped as, a, as divine, and is plastered on the temples with his name. It's his holy writ. And Paul is saying, no, it isn't. He is going right for the jugular of the beast. This is a very powerful sermon. Verse 27, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. He now begins to go into the detail of the arrest and the crucifixion of the true Savior. Now when they had fulfilled what was written concerning him, and he mentions Pilate, note that in verse 28. Pilate's the Roman governor. Pilate is the Roman authority. Pilate is the agent of the beast who condemned Jesus and sent him to the, the cross. And so again, he's, he's connecting it all together, and he's saying that government that this man represents and this temple on the hill deifies killed the Son of God. Pilate, his agent, did it. Now when they had fulfilled, verse 29, all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Dead. Augustus died. They put, him in a, they put his remains in a tomb. But verse 30, God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Our Soter, our Savior, did not suffer corruption. And in verse 32, he says, We declare to you glad tidings. That promise which was made to the fathers. Again, Glad tidings. The, that's another word for the term for the gospel. Good news. Glad tidings. We declare that to you. Paul's saying, I'm here telling you this. And I'm telling you that the words of Augustus are nothing. He's nothing. That temple is nothing. That statue of him up the hill that you, you can see, as you look at it and you'll look through the openings, and you'll see him sitting there. It's nothing. God has fulfilled this for our children, verse 33, in that he, was raised, uh, he raised up Jesus, 
as it is written in the psalm, the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that's a quote out of Psalm 2 and verse 7. Verse 34, and that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. That's out of Isaiah 55 and verse 3, where it says, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Verse 35, therefore he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's Psalm 1610. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. And again, he's, he's just laying out the whole story of the, the death, resurrection of Christ. He was not corrupted. And then he comes to his punchline in verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Augustus can't forgive sins. By him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. So here's a, here's a warning, and here's very clear gospel teaching of justification uh, before God and, and of forgiveness. But also, he says, what don't, he said, listen to this, beware, lest what has been spoken in the prophets, any of, any of the prophets, where it says, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work, a, work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though, it were to, though one were to declare it to you. This is a, an explicit quote from Habakkuk 1.5. Habakkuk 1.5, which is an interesting uh, minor prophet. Paul brings it in at this point in the story. Habakkuk was the prophet who said, hey, God, my people are awful. You know, help us. Please help us. God says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to raise up Babylon and bring against you. And, and Habakkuk says, they're worse than we are. Why would you use them? And then, you know, it's a beautiful three-verse or three-chapter uh, book, Habakkuk, in, in the Bible. Paul pulls this end of the story to, to connect it to judgment and the prophetic teaching. And here, who's here? Well, it's Judah. There sends the time of Habakkuk, but there's that Babylon again, because Babylon is the antagonist of the story in Habakkuk. And, and Paul uh, brings in this obscure verse from a, a small minor prophet, but it's a statement of warning and judgment and of repentance that Judah didn't he hear. Now he's telling this audience in this uh, New Testament setting that if you don't hear this, judgment will be upon you. Well, guess what? They didn't all hear. And judgment was upon them. And you go there today, and the city was forgotten. Ruins. Can't even find the synagogue that he spoke these words in. Is that not judgment? It's judgment. But it's also, as I said, a very strong political message, Paul aims his message right at the heart of the worship of idolatry. Gods that cannot hear, cannot speak, that are nothing. And he's preaching to them about the God who is everything. And so here's the end of, the, of verse 42. When, when, the news, when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They wanted to hear more. When the, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So it, it seems then for the next few days that there were some devout proselytes and many Jews who wanted to hear more. So wherever Paul and Barnabas took up a position, maybe in a remote place of a square of the city or some other type of room they found, we don't know but he continues to teach them through the week. And then verse 44 says, on the next Sabbath, seven days later, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Almost the whole city. Now, not, not everybody, but they got a few more people in here. It's a little bit hyper, hyper, hyperbole on part of Luke, but they got a crowd. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. I like to imagine 
The Jews who were accustomed to coming late and still having a seat came late that Sabbath, and they had no seats because these Gentiles start pouring in. And they were filled with envy, it says, and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. And so things are breaking up now. Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. And just as, again, the prophets had predicted, a light now is given to the, to the Gentiles and salvation is made known to the ends of the earth in that way. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. And so Luke doesn't give us a time frame, but it, it, it says that many believed, and this is the same word used earlier for Sergius Paulus in that he believed, and um, but there's a bit more here, as many as have been appointed to eternal life. I think, I think there's a bit more description to uh, the, the change here in these people, these Gentiles, than what we had with Sergius Paulus, but that's a finer point to debate that, you know, and, and um, still is, leaves us not fully knowing. But um, their success. They stay for a period of time. Now, just don't read right over verse 49. The word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. It gives us the indication that around Antioch and Pisidia, which then and, and now are a lot of small villages, um, probably people who heard Paul, maybe let's say they were there a month. We don't know, but it, it could have been a month or you know, several weeks. They took the word out there. Maybe Paul, maybe Barnabas split up and went to and walked out on Sabbath and other times to some of the Lord, other villages. Uh, through in, in this region of Antioch, but it gives us an idea that the gospel went beyond the confines of the city of Antioch and Pisidia. And they uh, probably had a measure of success. So much so that in verse 50, the Jews stirred up the devout prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. They shook off the dust from their feet against them, an idiom to basically, you know, show they uh, they... They had done their part. There's a, an official parting of the ways. And they came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, Iconium is about well, roughly 50 miles or so um, right here from Antioch. There's a main road, the, the Via Ignatia. Via, the Via Ignatia, E-G-N-A-T-I-A, -A, began in Ephesus and ran all the way over to the Euphrates. And it came right through Antioch and Pisidia. So they had a good Roman road to go down to Iconium. And that's where we'll pick up the story in the next class. Iconium is today the city of Konya in Turkey. We drove through that in our tour. There's really nothing to see there, uh, excavation archaeologically um, today. Konya, ancient Iconium, is the, they call it the Vatican of Islam. It's a hotbed of Islam. <laughs> And uh, so you don't see any desire to unearth the Christian past in the city of Konya in Turkey today. So we'll, we'll end it there. You, you see the, the power of this sermon and you see the connection uh, and how political and strong and dangerous it was for Paul to, in a sense, take on Augustus in a, in a city in the very shadow of a temple dedicated to Augustus in a city that revered him in many ways and to make a very strong message about the gospel. We'll pick it up next time in uh, uh, the remainder of Paul's first journey. I thought I would do it all today, but that was a little bit too ambitious in my thinking. So we'll see you next, next class.